What do blueberries, Uber Eats, and gasoline have in common? Well, they're all loaded with antioxidants, particularly if you use Uber Eats to deliver your supplements. If that seems like a stretch, it was, but the point is when it comes to sustainability, it's all connected somehow. And that's even more true when you're looking at the economy. See, among just about everything else in our capitalist society, blueberries, Uber Eats, and gas are all things people pay for. Maybe you'd even say they're things we pay too much for, especially once you've included all the Uber Eats fees and a tip. And you better be adding a tip. But in reality, they're things that we're not paying nearly enough for, because everything we produce and consume also has an environmental cost, and most of us are ignoring it. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. Here's the deal with the economy. It's the interconnected system of goods, services, producers, and consumers that creates wealth. And the science of modern day economics helps us understand how goods and services like blueberries, Uber Eats, and gasoline are produced, distributed, and consumed. But economics doesn't account for everything in that process. Because according to traditional economics, something has value only if people are willing to pay for it. And in the capitalist models that power world economies today, the most successful businesses are the ones that create value by getting customers to buy goods and services. The more customers want a product, the more money businesses can make, and the more value they create. To understand how much value a business is generating, that business takes stock of the cost of almost everything involved in creating and selling their product. Like, say I decided to open a blueberry-themed shop in my neighborhood. I'm talking the greatest blueberry shop imaginable. There's fresh blueberries, of course, but there's also blueberry jam, and blueberry pie, and blueberry muffins, and blueberry barbecue sauce, and blueberry juice. If you can make it with a blueberry, I've got it. But of course, if I want to compete with the corporate giant blueberries are us around the corner and turn a profit, I've got to make sure I can cover the costs of all the goods and services involved in producing and selling all my blueberry goods. First, I'll have to factor in the cost of materials I need, like blueberries, sugar, jars, and pie plates. Then I'll have to staff my shop, which means I'll have to account for labor costs too. Then I'll need to factor in the cost of warehousing and transportation to store my supplies and deliver those raw materials to my shop. Finally, I'll have to find people to buy my blueberries. That means investing in marketing to persuade consumers to buy from me and not blueberries are us. Once I know all these costs, I can find areas for improvement, like places to reduce costs by buying supplies in bulk, or ways to invest time in making my products better, like experimenting with new flavors, blueberry ketchup, blueberry pickles, the possibilities are endless. If customers love what I'm making, they'll come back to buy more and tell their friends about the best blueberry joint on the block. When that happens, I'll start making a profit, and I'm doing my economic duty by creating value. Of course, I'm not the only one paying for all these things. My customers are too. See, when we buy stuff, we're not just paying for that good or service, whether it's blueberries, Uber Eats, or gasoline, we're paying for the whole process that made that good or service available to us. For example, when we pay for the gas that fuels our car, we're actually paying a portion of what it costs companies to extract, refine, and distribute gas to customers around the world. Every industry and company involved in the step-by-step -step process of bringing that product to local gas stations gets a piece of what you pay at the pump. And our economy depends on consumers like us to help cover the cost of putting gas on the market. More than that, it counts on us to help all the companies involved in producing and selling gas turn a profit. Because when companies profit, they produce more gas, which people buy, which helps the economy keep going. The thing is, even though customers and businesses are paying for products and processes all along the supply chain, there are also lots of costs that no one is paying for, at least not with money. Those costs that no one's paying for are known as ecosystem services. That's things that nature provides like water, healthy soil, fresh air, pollinators, and much more. And we depend on them to create, sell, and consume products. Without them, there would be no blueberries. No blueberries means no blueberry shop, and no shop means no economic value. Tragedy. But it's really complicated to calculate the costs of our impact on the water cycle, or our carbon emissions, or our waste. It's hard to see our impact on the environment until much later. And it also, well, costs more, so most businesses just don't do it. The price you pay at the register usually doesn't cover the cost of these environmental consequences. And when producers don't include the price that nature pays, we get a false picture of what things really cost. But there is a cost, and when we put blinders on and ignore that, we're just kicking the can down the road. Eventually, we will pay that price. Whether that's losing our homes to disasters fueled by climate change, or seeing higher prices on all of our goods when we've used up the raw materials we need to produce them. So some economists argue that if we want to keep using nature's services to support a thriving economy, we have to figure out ways to assign value to the benefits nature gives us and factor them into business decisions. That's what sustainability economics is all about, finding ways to support long-term economic growth and responsibility without harming the environment. And the first step in doing that is to understand all the ways everything is connected and figure out all the environmental impacts that come with producing and consuming goods and services. One way to do that is figuring out how an economic activity positively or negatively impacts people who aren't directly involved in the activity itself. Economists call these outcomes externalities, and they can be good or bad. For instance, let's say your town is building a new highway, but the runoff from the construction pollutes your town's freshwater sources. The outcome is bad for your community, which makes it a negative externality. But let's say your town is also investing in wind energy. That lowers carbon dioxide emissions, creates cleaner air, and lowers your energy bill. 
The outcome of this is good for people, so economists would label it a positive externality. And according to sustainability economists, placing a monetary value on both negative and positive externalities could impact how we use ecosystem services. Like imagine you're using Uber Eats to get a blueberry pie from my shop to your apartment. And when you place your order, you can choose whether to have your pie delivered by bicycle or a car. The bike delivery is gonna have more positive externalities. Less traffic on city streets makes commuting safer and fewer cars means less pollution. You live pretty far from my shop though, so if you choose the car delivery, you'll probably get your pie a lot faster. But now your delivery is creating more negative externalities. You'll be contributing to both traffic and air pollution. Even if you know that bike delivery is better for the environment, you really want this pie, so you're tempted to choose the faster delivery time. But what if having your pie delivered by car were a lot more expensive to account for those negative externalities? And say those costs went all the way up the chain. So not only are you paying more for your delivery, but the delivery driver is paying more for their gas, and Uber Eats is paying extra fees every time someone orders a car delivery. And the blueberry pie is more expensive because I'm paying more for the blueberries because the farmer is paying more for the water and the soil and the air to grow them. Well, nobody would be very happy about that. But factoring all the costs, including environmental ones, into the actual price of goods and services is known as true cost accounting. When we use true cost accounting, the real price tag of our actions can become pretty eye-opening. Take the carbon dioxide that's stuck in the atmosphere thanks in part to gas-powered vehicles. According to the US government in 2022, the cost of the damage carbon does to the environment, our societies, and our health is about $50 per ton. And while that might not seem like a lot, the US creates 6.3 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year, so that $50 a ton adds up. Or if we're accounting for the negative externalities of gas, some estimate that a gallon could cost as much as $15. And paying $15 per gallon of gas sounds outrageous, but if we did, it would actually lead to a lot of savings. Because understanding the true cost of our goods and services could help people, businesses, and governments make different decisions. Like the pain of paying $15 a gallon for gas would make a lot of people more likely to walk or ride a bike. So it might be a fast way to encourage countries to invest in things like adding bike lanes and mass transit systems or incentivizing the switch to renewable energy. If that sounds unlikely, in some ways it's already happening. Except the idea isn't really that individuals and businesses are paying outrageous costs. Instead, this kind of change comes from the very top through economic policies that promote the production and consumption of goods and services with the lowest environmental cost. That means taxes on processes and products that are bad for the environment and subsidies for the ones that are good for it. Sweden has been doing this since 1991. Their polluter pays principle puts the cost of carbon emissions on the shoulders of the folks who cause them. They tax fossil fuels according to how much carbon they emit when burned. So coal has the highest taxes, followed by heating oils and natural gas. Sweden's carbon tax generates revenue for its government, but it's also a cornerstone of Swedish climate policy. It provides incentives for individuals and businesses to reduce energy use, become more energy efficient, and switch to renewable energy. Since its rollout in 1991, Sweden's carbon tax has gradually increased, which has given households and businesses time to adapt. That's how Sweden reduced their emissions by over a third. And the increased revenue Sweden makes from taxing carbon also let them reduce other taxes, like income taxes. Even more importantly, taxing carbon didn't tank Sweden's economy, it helped it. Since 1991, Sweden's GDP has shot up by over 50%, partly because the carbon tax nudged investments towards other profitable technologies, like renewable energy. And Sweden isn't alone. Making polluters pay is becoming a more popular concept, including in the US, where the government taxes fossil fuel and chemical companies using the same idea. That money goes toward cleaning up really polluted sites that would otherwise wait years for help from the government because of the cost. Like I said before, it's all connected. Blueberries, Uber Eats, gasoline, individuals, businesses, governments, the environment, and the economy. And of course, the actions we take now are connected to the actions we've taken in the past and the actions we'll be able to take in the future. In our current system, no one can really afford to account for the environmental costs of our actions, products, and services, but we also can't afford not to. It's like how all those antioxidants in your blueberries, gasoline, and Uber Eats order are about limiting damage now to keep things running in the long term. With the right economic policies in place, we can limit the damage to the environment too. But doing that and avoiding a much more expensive future all starts with eating more blueberries and understanding the value of the environment but really just eating more blueberries. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you wanna help us out, give this video a like, comment if you like blueberries, I love low bush main blueberries, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, see you next time.